welcome to the Orthodox View, where we discuss latest religious news from an Orthodox Christian perspective. I'm your host, Philip Champion. The Orthodox Church is now proceeding through the Holy Week and is getting ready for the glorious Pascha. But many other Christians, Catholics, Protestants, and others, have already celebrated Easter last Sunday. To them we say, Christ is risen. The United Bible Societies, UBS, has announced that a record-breaking number of 57 new translations of the Holy Scriptures, or its parts, were completed in 2022. Of those translations, 14 were full translations, 5 were for the New Testament, and 38 were for the specific parts of the Bible. The milestone has enabled 100 million individuals to read and access scripture in their native language for the first time. According to the UBS, the Bible is currently available in 733 languages, allowing 5.9 billion people to read the Holy Scriptures. The New Testament has been translated into 1,622 languages, while parts of the Bible have been translated into 1,255 languages. However, there are still approximately 3,776 languages that lack translations of the Scriptures. The organization plans to finish 200 translations of the Bible by the end of this year, with at least 300 other underway. 15 European Union countries have joined the European Commission's lawsuit against Hungary over their quote-unquote controversial child protection law that is accused of being anti-LGBT. Now, what is so controversial about it? Well, the Hungarian law, ratified in June 2021, contains one provision that prohibits or heavily restricts depictions of homosexuality and gender reassignment in media content and educational material addressed to underage audiences. That means children and teenagers younger than 18 years of age. According to the European Commission representatives, that Hungarian bill goes against the EU values. The Hungarian response was quick. Their justice minister, Judith Varga, said that education is a national competence and it is the right of parents to decide on the education of their children. She added that the Hungarians will go to the wall if it's about protecting their children. What can I say? Why depiction of homosexuality to children has become one of the quote-unquote EU values is truly beyond my understanding. And whatever one may think of the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban politically, we can only wish him God's help in protecting their children. His Grace Bishop Nikita of Ivano-Frankovsk of the canonical Ukrainian Orthodox Church was physically assaulted on the 9th of April. The attack against the bishop occurred outside the Chernovtsi diocesan administration building and was caught on camera. The Diocese of Chernovtsi reports that a man in a red Mazda slowly drove by the bishop and his subdeacon, but then turned back because he had recognized the highway. The man stopped his car, got out, and punched the bishop in the face. He then attacked the subdeacon, whose father and brother are currently serving in the Ukrainian army. According to the diocesan report, after the arrival of the police, the attacker continued to threaten violence and again started a fight. However, he was not arrested. Unfortunately, this story is just one of many examples of what is happening to the long-suffering Ukrainian Orthodox Church right now. For instance, Look at how two elderly parishioners were greeted by a crowd in the Ukrainian city of Ternopol on their way to church. The only reason why the militant crowd is acting in such a way is because the two elderly parishioners belong to the canonical Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And it doesn't seem to matter that the sons or grandsons of those women may be fighting in the Ukrainian armed forces. Just like it didn't matter in the story of Bishop Nikita and his subdeacon, whose father and brother are Ukrainian soldiers. What matters is that the vast majority of the Ukrainian population remains faithful to the canonical church and its first hierarch, Metropolitan Anufri of Kiev and all Ukraine. 
And that makes certain people very frustrated. Meanwhile, his Beatitude Metropolitan Anufri had published a video addressing the clergy and the faithful of the Khmelnytsky Diocese, which has been under increased attack by the schismatics of the so-called Orthodox Church of Ukraine and the authorities. Here's what he said. Today the Lord has allowed you to suffer with him. It is a great honor for a Christian when he suffers with Christ. I understand that it's hard for you, that there is a lot of untruth, but the Lord also endured lies. We should thank God for everything. This doesn't mean that we should give up and be passive. We must protect our holy sites. We must defend our churches and monasteries by legal means. But we must not have malice against people, against those who attack us, who abuse us. We must pray for all that the Lord may strengthen the good in the good and give the evil a spirit of repentance, so that they understand that when you abuse another, it is a sin, and you abuse yourself. Now, let us compare it with a recent statement of Mr. Sergei Dumenko, who calls himself Metropolitan Epiphany of the so-called Orthodox Church of Ukraine. In a recent interview to the Ukrainian TV channel Suspilny, he said the following. We do not support evicting monks from the Kiev Pechersk Lavra. We support preventing the spirit of the Russian world from reigning here. We are for the Ukrainian Lavra, where people will always pray in Ukrainian for our Ukraine. There are many things about this statement that are problematic. But I'd like to note that, first of all, the canonical Ukrainian Orthodox Church is already praying for Ukraine and the Kiev Pechersk Lavra during every divine service. And secondly, they do it not in Ukrainian, not in Russian, but in Church Slavonic. That is, in the special liturgical language that the Holy Church has been using in services for over a thousand years. It was in Church Slavonic that the founders of the Kiev Pechersk Lavra, Saint Anthony and Saint Theodosius of Kiev, prayed as well. And what they prayed about was repentance and salvation, which is what the Lavra is all about. But perhaps the so-called Metropolitan Epiphany doesn't actually care about those things. Well, only God can judge. A couple of days ago, we celebrated the Cosmonautics Day. That is because on April 12, 1961, aboard the spacecraft Vostok 1, Russian cosmonaut and Soviet pilot Yuri Gagarin became the first human being to travel into space. Since then, Gagarin had become a hero for millions, if not billions, of people around the globe. But what was his attitude towards religion? Was he a militant atheist who allegedly said that he hadn't seen God in space? That is a quotation that was attributed to him by the Soviets. Or maybe he was a person who was genuinely interested to learn more about Christianity and the Orthodox Church. Well, according to Colonel Valentin Petrov, associate professor at the Gagarin Air Force Academy and a close friend of Gagarin himself, he once accompanied the first man in space to the Holy Trinity Lavra of St. Sergius, in modern Sergiev Passat. There, they were invited not only to see the monastery itself, but also the Moscow Theological Academy. Here's what happened. We went to the Church Archaeology Museum at the Moscow Theological Academy. And something happened there that absolutely amazed me. When we came to look at the model of the destroyed Cathedral of Christ the Savior, Yuri looked at it and said to me, Valentin, look what a lovely thing they have destroyed. He kept looking at it for a long time. When we were coming back from the Lavra, we were so impressed by what we saw that we drove like in a hypnotic trance. Yuri said suddenly, Valentin, just think about the words, who art in heaven. I glared at him and asked, Yuri, you know the prayers? He answered, what, you think you alone know them? Well, make sure to keep quiet. The reason why Gagarin asked his friend to keep quiet was because it was 1964, right at the end of Khrushchev's anti-religious campaign. However, that didn't stop Gagarin to later speak at the Communist Central Committee plenary session on education of the youth and openly suggest that the Cathedral of Christ the Savior must be restored. That is the same cathedral that was earlier blown up by the Bolsheviks in 1931. The presidium of the Central Committee was seriously shocked, of course, but certainly they could do nothing against Yuri Gagarin. 
The cathedral hadn't been restored until the year 2000. We also don't know if Yuri Gagarin had actually become an Orthodox believer. Unfortunately, he died in a plane crash in 1968. What we do know, however, is that he was baptized and very much respected the Orthodox Church. For instance, in this photograph you can see him standing and smiling next to His Holiness Patriarch Alexei I of Moscow and all Rus. Nevertheless, I do sincerely hope that Yuri Gagarin, the first man to travel into space, had actually managed to find God. Meanwhile, that's all for today. Thank you for watching and see you next time on the Orthodox View.